to start. Okay. But <laughs> you've got a few stories a to tell. Yes, and right. they're, they're longer stories now, if that's right. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah. yes, with, with an hour. Grand. Okay, well, I'll tell you, I'm from Belcoo, which is a small village here in Fermanagh, and mm-hmm. it's, there's not an awful lot happens in it, or there's not nothing remarkable about it. But there were two lads who lived in Belcoo, and they were the best of company. They were they were friends from when they were in the, the nursery school, the primary school, secondary school, all the way up. Nothing could bother them or come between them except for the one thing. There was one thing they couldn't agree on. One of them, he always told the truth. If the master says, are you talking down there? He'd say, yes, sir. Sorry, sir. It was me. But the other fella, he always told lies. He loved to tell lies. And if the master said, are you talking? He said, no, sir, it's not me. It's that man who's on the ladder trying to get the bird's nest out of the gutter. And of course, the whole class would be over up looking out the window and there'd be no man and no ladder. And sure, there, was no, there wasn't even a gutter in the school. And by the time the master had them all settled, he'd have forgotten what the original problem was and your man got away with it. So this was what he was always saying. You're better off telling lies. You'll get away with anything. You're a fool to be telling the truth. So anyway, on they went till they were about 18 years of age and it was time for them to go out into the big wide world because there was no work to be had in Belcoo. So they got up this day, put their packs on their backs and they headed off out the road side by side, happy as could be until they came to a fork in the road. So this posed a real dilemma. What were they going to do? Were they going to go this way or were they going to go that way? And they stood there scratching their heads for a while and then one of them had a brainwave. He says, you know what we'll do? You go that way and you tell your lies and I'll go this way and I'll tell me truth and we'll come back to this point in seven years time and we'll compare notes and we'll see which of us got on the better. That will decide the argument for once and for all. That's a great idea, he said. So they shook hands and away off they went. Well, we followed the liar first of all. The liar went off and he hadn't gone very far. He saw a big farmhouse up on the top of a hill and he went up to the, rolled his brass up the, to the front door and he knocked on the door. And the woman came out and she says, what do you want? And he says, I'm looking for work. He says, I'm a fine, big, strong, strapping man. I'm looking for some work. Well, she said, are you any good with horses? Ah, oh, he said, horses? Sure, look, it didn't my father train the winner of the Grand National twice in the one year. And my mother was a jockey. And sure, wasn't I born in a stable myself? Oh, that's great. She says, come on in, come on in. You're just the man I'm looking for. So she gave him his dinner. And that evening he went out into the farmyard and he got talking to the other men. And he learned enough to get him started the next morning. But the poor fella who always told the truth, the first house he went up to, he knocked on the door and the man came out and says, well, what do you want? And he says, look, I'm a fine, strong man from Belcoo. I'm looking for some work. Well, he says, would you be any good at plucking turkeys? I need somebody to pluck turkeys. Oh, no, he said, to tell you the God's honest truth, I couldn't go near a turkey because I'm allergic to feathers. My eyes would start watering and my nose would be streaming and I'd be coughing and spluttering. Well, you're no use to me. He said, go away out of that now. Don't be annoying me. So off he went. And he went to the second house and he knocked on the door. And the woman this time, she was looking for someone to milk the goat. Oh, he said, look, I'd love to help you, ma'am, but I had a very bad experience. I was, when I was seven years old, I was coming home from school and this big buck goat came after me with the horns and I have the marks yet. I could show you to you. Oh, no, you won't. She said, go away out of this and don't be annoying me head. And the poor fella, he walked all day. And he called at every house and he told the truth everywhere he went and he didn't get any work anywhere. And at the end of the day, he didn't know where he was. He was away up in the mountain somewhere. And I'll tell you how lonesome it was. There was grass growing up the middle of the road. There was only heather and boulders in the field. There was no electricity poles or telegraph poles. There wasn't even any election posters. That's how remote a place it was. And he just said to himself, well, now the next house I see, I'm going to go up to the front door. I'll tell them the truth that I'm only a poor labouring man and that I'm starving and cold and tired. And maybe they'll let me sleep in the barn and they might give me a sup of milk in the morning. So he struggled on, putting one foot in front of the other. 
until eventually he saw way in the distance, just as the night was falling, he saw a building. He said, right, that's where I'm heading for. But as he got closer, he saw that it was only a ruin. And as the night closed right in around him, he discovered it was an old church in the middle of a graveyard. But he couldn't go any farther, so he said, I'm going to have to spend the night here. And he opened the door and it creaked and there was cobwebs and dust falling down. And there was still a few old pews there, so he lay down on one of the pews. He put his bag under his back and he fell asleep almost immediately. Well, just about midnight, something disturbed his sleep. And he listened and he thought, I can hear voices. This is bad. Who? What sort of people would be in an old church at midnight? Is it robbers? Is it kidnappers? Is it drugs people? Or what sort of carry on is this at all? So very cautiously, he raised his head and looked up over the pew. And do you know what he saw? You won't believe this. But I'm telling you the truth, because this story is all about the truth. There was cats, hundreds and hundreds of cats. Because once every seven years, all the cats in the country gather together for the cats parliament that come from Belfast and Dublin and Cork and Kerry and Galway, all over. Because once every seven years, all the cats in the country can talk like humans. Now you might think, I am telling lies, but I'm telling you the truth and I can prove it. Because before this parliament happens every year, the cats be outside at night sitting on the wall and they're practicing the talk. And just like a baby, a baby has to practice. They're going blah, 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 blah. And the cats are going wah, 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 like that. Putting their mouths around the words till they get it right. And when they get it right, off they go. And the proof of it is, if you hear your cat meowling on the wall, you'll not see it for a couple of days. That's because it's at the cat's parliament, away in the old church up at the top of the hills. And sitting in the middle of them, on a big velvet cushion, was the most gorgeous big black tom cat that you ever did see, with big whiskers and lovely sleek fur and a big long tail. And he was purring. He was very happy. He was very content because he was telling them, my friend cats, as you know, I have the life of Riley. I live in Buckingham Palace. I sleep on the end of the princess's bed. I have a butler who brings me warm milk and a silver saucer every morning. And I have a servant who brings me smoked salmon on a golden platter every evening. Ah, yes, I have the life of it. And they're all pouring, they're all delighted, because all these cats, they love to be pampered. This is what they all aspire to. They're so proud of the king of the cats. But, my friend cats, he said, this year something happened that threatened my livelihood. The princess, he said, she became a teenager. And she decided she wanted a pony, a big-bellied buck tooth pony and they got her the pony and they put the pony in the stable and the pony started complaining about rats and mice and the king said oh take that old cat moi an old cat take that old cat and put it in the stable that's what they did they put me in the stable with the big bellied buck tooth pony and the mice and the rats me the king of the cats well my friend cats he said that evening, I got back into the palace through an open window and I went into the larder and there in the larder on the, mid on the table, on a plate was a big slab of Kerrygold butter. And I got my tail, my beautiful hairy tail, and I rubbed it across the butter and left hairs in the butter. And the princess, she came in to get her, her supper. And she had her slice of toast and she put the butter on it and she put the marmalade on it and she went jump 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 and the hairs stuck in her throat uh, like that and she couldn't breathe uh, and ever since that day she's up in her bedroom at the top floor of buckingham palace 
and there's doctors coming from Harley Street and Trinity College and the Sorbonne and all sorts of places. But my friend cats, there's only one cure for the hair in the throat. And that's a drink of water from the well at the bottom of the graveyard out there. I'm sure they'll never find that out for all their medical expertise. And they're all pouring and swishing their tails in delight. And the honest man is listening to all this and he's horrified and he can't believe what he's hearing. So he lies back down again and he falls asleep. And in the morning when he wakes up, it's all quiet. And he was thinking to himself, that was an awful dream I had last night. What sort of a nightmare was that at all? It must have been because I'm hungry and cold and tired. Mind you, he said, I can smell cats. But maybe that's what caused it. That there's, there's probably cats around this place at night and I could smell them and that, that caused the whole nightmare. I'd better head on anyway and get some work. So he picked up his bag and he went out. And when he went outside and he looked around, he saw the graveyard and then he saw the well. The well at the bottom of the graveyard, which he couldn't have seen last night because it was dark. So he realised it was true. It wasn't a dream. I know what happened to the princess. So he decided I'm going to have to do something about this. So instead of looking for work, he went straight over to England. He went straight up to Buckingham Palace and he knocked on the door. And the guard came out and said, yes, what do you want? He says, hello, I'm from Belle Coo. I I hear the princess is sick. The princess is not sick. Who told you that? The cat. The cat? What do you mean the cat told you? I'm telling you, it was the cat from the palace, the big black cat that sleeps on the end of the princess's bed. It told me that the princess is sick. <laughs> what sort of nonsense is this? Who are you anyway? He says, I'm from Belle Coo. Everybody knows me. I never told a lie in my life. Ha, ha, ha. This is a queer one altogether. So he starts calling the other guards and the servants. They're all, they're all having us. This chap here, he says he never told a lie in his life. Let's see. So they all start asking him questions about Manchester United and things like that that he knows nothing about. But he does his best to always tell the truth. And they're all laughing and thinking this is hilarious. This mad Irish man who has landed at the gate with this crazy story about a cat that talks. And then one of them says, OK, Paddy, what else did the cat tell you? Oh, this will be good. What else did the cat tell you? Well, he said, the cat told me that there's one of you guys has to bring him warm milk in a silver saucer every morning. And they all start laughing. Except for one poor fella, and he goes red in the face. He says, oh, please, don't tell anybody. If my wife knew that I was a cat servant, oh, she'd leave me. She thinks I'm the accountant. After all the years of study, this is what I'm doing. And, said the man from Belcou, realising that he had his, his entree now, he says, not only that, he says, there's another one of you who brings the cat smoked salmon on a golden platter every evening. And again, they start laughing, smoked salmon, ha, <laughs> ha. But this one guy goes red in the face and says, oh, it would break my mother's heart if she knew that I was a cat servant. She scrimped and saved for years and years to put me through college. And I told her that I'm the chief executive. Oh, if she knew. So gradually the word spread up to the very top of the palace to where the king was. And the king said, send that man up. He said, I have been king for 27 years. Nobody ever tells me the truth. They all say, oh, you're wonderful, your majesty. You look beautiful, your majesty. And I could have made dinner slobbered down the front of my jacket. So send him up. So they sent the poor man right up to the top of the palace. And all the doctors said, don't let that man near the princess. He knows nothing about medicine. That's right, said the man from Belco. I know nothing about medicine. But he says, I, but said the king, I want to hear his story in any case. So he tells the whole story, just as I've told it to you about the, the old church and the cat's parliament and the king of the cats. And he takes out the bottle and he's holding it there. And he says, and this is the bottle of water from the well at the bottom of the graveyard. And while he's still talking and they're all concentrating on his story, the princess who is lying in bed with one eye open, she reaches up, grabs the bottle and goes, glug, 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 glug. And there's horror. Everybody is shocked. 
Has he poisoned the princess? What's going to happen? She finds, I can breathe, I can breathe, I'm cured. And she jumps out of bed and she gives the man from Belcou a big hug. And all the doctors, they slink away in disgust because they realise they're not going to get paid today. And the king says, oh, this is wonderful. At last you have cured my daughter. At last I have found somebody who will tell the truth. He said, listen, he said, I'll give you anything you want. You can have a Rolls Royce. You can have a castle in Scotland. In fact, you can have Scotland if you like. You have cured my daughter. No, said the honest man from Belcou, to tell you the God's honest truth. All I want right now is me breakfast. Your breakfast? He is telling the truth. Oh, this is, this is wonderful. So they give the poor man his breakfast. They give him a room in the palace. And they said, you can come and work for us. And that's exactly what happened. And after a number of years, as happens in fairy stories like this, the man from Belcou and the princess, they fell in love. And eventually they got married. And it was a most extraordinary marriage because she had something that nobody else had. She had, a, now whether it's a good thing or not, I'm not sure, but she had a man who always told her the truth. But at least when one day after seven years, he said, listen, darling, I have to go to Belcou today to meet a liar. She knew he was telling the truth. He wasn't going off to meet another woman. He wasn't going down to the bookies. No, he was going back to Belcou to meet a liar. And back he went till he came to that fork in the road and he wasn't long standing there till he saw his friend coming towards him. And the two of them gave each other a big hug and shook hands and fist bumped and high fived and all the rest. And they said, well, how did you get on? No, you tell me for you. And of course, there's a bit of rivalry there. But eventually the liar, he couldn't, he couldn't restrain himself anymore. He said, all right, I'll tell you. Wait till you hear how I got on. He said, I was really lucky, he said. I was only gone over the first hill and round the corner. And this big helicopter came down from the sky. And it landed in a field. And the doors opened and out stepped Donald Trump. And he says, I'm looking for someone to manage my Hotel California. Could you manage my Hotel California? Oh, Danny boy, says I, I'm the man. And I told him about all the hotels I'd managed before. And he took me in the helicopter and he brought me straight over to America and put me in charge of this great big hotel. And I fell in love with this beautiful woman from, from, from New Mexico. And we have two children. And you know what? They're so intelligent that they're at Yale University. And you know that TV programme, Young Sheldon? That's my children. They're, they're geniuses altogether. But when the honest man looked at him, he could see that he had broken dirty fingernails and holes in his shoes. And he thought, no, this man is still telling lies. This man's not working for Donald Trump. Well, let's hear how you got on then. So the honest man told him the whole story, just like I have told you about the King of the Cats and the Old Church and Buckingham Palace and the drink of water and the princess with the hair in her throat. And the liar just looked at him and he started to laugh and he says, I win the bet. It has taken you seven years, but you're a better liar than I am now. It, the world has changed you. You have, he says, that's the most wonderful pack of lies. I couldn't have made that up. That is brilliant. That is genius. No, he said, look, you have to believe me. That's the God's honest truth. That's exact. No, 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 I win. That's li You're a liar now. We're all liars together. You have learned something from being out in the big way. No, honestly, I'm telling you the truth. So they still couldn't agree. And they shook hands and away off they went. And the honest man went back to Buckingham Palace to his princess and he lived happily ever after. But the liar, he was thinking... He was thinking, he said, that man never told a lie in his life. That man couldn't tell a lie, even if his life depended on it. Therefore, maybe there just might be a grain of truth in what he was saying. And what did he say? The cats, they meet in their parliament 
once every seven years. And how long is it since we were here before? Seven years. Therefore, if I go to the old ruined church tonight, the cats might be there and I might hear something useful. So he turned on his heel and he walked the other way. And he walked and walked all day until he came to that place where the grass was growing up through the middle of the road and there was only rocks and heather in the fields and there was no telegraph poles or lamps or election posters or anything. And just as it was getting dark, as the night was closing in around him, he saw in the distance an old building. And as he got closer, yes, it was an old ruin. And as the night closed in, yes, it was an old church in the middle of a graveyard. So he went in. And he lay down on the pew and he fell asleep. And just about midnight, something disturbed his sleep. And he looked up. And yes, there they were. Hundreds and hundreds of cats. But what was this? In the middle of them, on the big velvet cushion, was the most scrawny, mangy, miserable, muggy bag of bones with a broken tail and a torn ear and a sore paw that you ever saw. This was the king of the cats and he was spitting and very, very angry indeed. My friend cats, he said, the last time we met here, I lived in Buckingham Palace. I slept on the end of the princess's bed and I had the life of it. But somebody heard our story. And when the cat, the king, found out what I had done, he grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and threw me in the moat. And for the last seven years, I, the king of the cats, I have been walking the highways and byways of Ireland, drinking out of puddles and eating birds. So, my friends... Before we say another word, I want you to search the church and when you find that man, I want you to tear him to shreds. Well, when the liar heard this, he jumped up and he says, Hi guys, listen, it wasn't me. I'm telling you the truth. But all the cats just looked at him. They said, No, we know you. You're the liar from Belcou. Everybody knows that you tell lies all the time. You're telling lies now. So he ran out of the church and the last sight we had of him, he was running down that hill and there were 427 crazed cats chasing after him. So I ask you, my friends, what's the right thing to do? To tell the truth or to tell lies? So that's my version of an old Fermanagh story. Believe it or not. Wow. <laughs> Obviously, Donald Trump. Drink water. <laughs> Donald Trump wasn't in the original. You know? That was a good handy transfer. All right, thank you. <laughs> oh, I'll get a drink of water. Thank you. Now I don't know if that's the sort of stuff you want. That's, that's brilliant. <laughs> that is absolutely brilliant. Have you another one as well? Mm-hmm. Open to answer. I'll do another wee one. <clears throat> Um, but as in the, the background, that, that one, I found it in the Irish Folklore Commission. Right. It was a man from out in, in Cashel, which is between Belcou and Garrison, uh, wrote it down in the 1940s. He had heard it as a child about 1910. So the story is over 100 years old. And obviously I've updated it a wee bit. But the basic bones of the story go back at least 100 years. So I, as a storyteller, I like to be able to put old stories back into circulation you know and so that's what i've done with and that thank one. you and what we'll do is probably add that what you just said there that okay. summary yes. at the end surely that's great that is perfect no that problem. is perfect just to give it a wee bit so mm, the next perfect. one if you give it a wee bit of an intro right i will indeed yeah and then do you want to wait for a bit before you start the other one are you all right i'm, ha- I'm, I'm happy enough yeah yeah okay um this next one is a story that henry glassy the the folklorist um gathered in picked up in the, the Balmalek Arnie area when he was here in the 1970s. Again, this is my own version of it. It is also, it, it's called Sleepy Pendoodle. And uh, a writer called Malachy Doyle has done a children's book based on the story. But I said, this is 
the version that I would use when I'm I'm going around schools t telling uh, children uh, yarns. Um, it starts off basically that I was on my way here. I didn't know where I, where exactly this place was, so I had to stop and ask directions. And I called in as a little house. And in this house, there was just an old man and an old woman lived there. Just them. And the they're knocking in the wrong door. Let's <laughs> start, start, start again. Start again. Yeah, Sorry about that. Great. No, no problem. <clears throat> now, as you know, I'm a storyteller and I go around from place to place. And often I find it's I have difficulty finding the exact place I'm supposed to be like coming here today for instance I had to stop and ask directions so I called in at a little house that's just over there and there was an old couple living in it when they heard I was a storyteller they said oh sure come on in wait till you hear our story and there was just themselves and they had a big dog a lovely big old black floppy sort of easy going old dog and they were telling me that a few weeks ago they were very worried about the dog. There was something wrong with the dog. The dog was going in under the table and it was scratching and it was going up on the sofa and it was turning round in circles and it was trying to catch its tail. And they thought, maybe the dog has fleas. So they got the flea powder and they shook it all over the dog and that didn't do any good. And they, they tried washing the dog and they tried letting it out more often and bringing it for walks nothing the dog was still very unsettled so eventually they decided they were going to have to bring the dog somewhere now where would you bring the dog no not the dentist i wouldn't put a dog near a dentist they brought the dog to the vet and the vet put the dog up on the table and he got a torch and he shone it in the dog's ear and he shone it up the dog's nose and he looked at the dog's tongue and he felt the dog and he looked at the other end of the dog but we'll not talk about that he looked it all over and he says i've got news for you and they says oh no what's wrong with the poor dog he says it's good news oh they said yes he said the dog is going to have puppies oh that's brilliant that's wonderful that's that's the greatest. We're so happy. Thank you very much. That'll be 50 quid, said the vet. Oh, right. Okay, they weren't so happy about that, but they gave him the 50 quid. And they went home and they made a bed for the dog in under the table. And every, after about a week or so, the old guy would be getting up in the morning. He'd be very stiff and he'd be going one and two and three. And he'd get up and he'd straighten his back and he'd go in and he'd say, hello, good morning, how are you? And he'd be in looking under the table to see if there was any sign of any puppies. No puppies. Never mind. The second week it was the same. He got up and he was looking in under the table. Was there any puppies? There was no puppies. And the third week there was no puppies. And by this stage they were saying, that owl vet. He got our hopes up and he took our 50 quid. 50 quid for nothing. Hmm. So it was worse than if they had never had any talk of puppies at all. They would have been able to cope with that. But the fact that their, their hopes had been raised and now it seemed their hopes were dashed. But then a few days later, he thought he saw something moving in the dog's blanket. And when he looked, sure enough, there was one tiny little puppy. Oh, the cutest wee thing you ever saw with a wee tail and a wee pink tongue. But the thing is, and now you might know this, but the thing is when puppies are born, they're blind. They don't open their eyes. They stay close to the mummy dog the whole time. And that's what happened in this case. Monday, it didn't open its eyes. Tuesday, it didn't open its eyes. Wednesday, Thursday, and he starts getting worried. Do you think there's anything wrong with this dog? Why is it not opened its eyes yet? I hope it's okay. Ah, don't worry, it'll be fine. Friday, it still hadn't opened its eyes. I'm beginning to think, well, we're not bringing it back to that vet. Oh, no, not another 50 quid for something to tell us something we don't need to know. Saturday, it hadn't opened its eyes. He says, I'm sure that dog's blind. There's definitely something wrong with that dog. I mean, 
What will we do with a blind dog? You can't throw a, throw a stick for a blind dog. It'd be no use with the sheep, no use as a guard dog. It couldn't even bring me my slippers in the evening. Sunday the dog hadn't opened its eyes. Oh, the dog is blind. The poor dog's blind. What are we going to do? Oh, God love it. It's all such a beautiful wee creature, but it's blind. Oh, this was terrible. But anyway, Monday morning they had a routine that the old fella always went into town to get the groceries. And as you know, when you get older, you get a bit forgetful. So the two of them would sit at the kitchen table and they made out a list of all the things they needed to get. And there were sausages and bananas and cheese and tomatoes and dog food. And all the usual things. Big long list. As long as a toilet roll sort of. Oh yes, toilet rolls, that's another thing. As long as a toilet roll. And away off he went into town. And do you know what? He forgot the list. He forgot the list. But it doesn't really matter because... Sure, he bought the same things every week. He would go into town and he'd start over there at Asda and then he'd go to Tesco and then he'd go to Dunn stores and then he'd go to Lidl. And by the time he was finished, he had two big bags of shopping and he was tired. But he thought, well, since I'm in town, I might as well go up the middle of the town and see if there's anybody about or see, what's, or see if there's any news. So he wandered up the middle of the town he was a bit thirsty and he saw Blake's pub and he thought, maybe I'll go in and have a pint. And he went into Blake's pub and he sat down. Now, I'm sure you've seen the ads on the television for a drink. And it's all kyola goes crack goes banjos. And there's people yahooing and it's not like that at all. In this pub, they're all sitting there with long, miserable faces on them all moaning about the pains in their legs and the bad weather and the price of petrol. Oh, they're the most depressing looking crowd you ever saw. And in the middle of them was our old fella. And he was sitting there crying into his drink. Me poor dog's blind. Blind, blind, blind. What am I going to do with a blind dog? Oh, it was terrible. And then his friend happened to come in. Ah, hello, how are you doing? Oh, he says, you're looking awful. What's wrong? Is there somebody dead? Is there, what on earth has happened? Oh, he says, it's worse than that. He says, me poor dog's blind. I have this lovely little puppy and it's, I've had it a week and it hasn't opened its eyes and it, it must be blind. What am I going to do? Ah, listen, he says, there's nothing wrong with your dog. He says, you see that fine sheep dog I have out there? That dog was blind, but there was a woman was coming round, she was selling tickets. And the first prize was a week in Bondoran. And the second prize was two weeks in Bondoran. Think of that. And I was telling her about the dog, she says, there's nothing wrong with your dog. All you have to do is take it up in your arms and cuddle it like a baby. And you have to sing to it. La 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 And then you say the magic words three times Open your eyes sleepy pendoodle What? Open your eyes sleepy pendoodle You say that three times and I guarantee to you that your wee dog will open its eyes That's brilliant That's wonderful I love to do that but he says how am I going to remember that? Open your eyes, sleepy pendoodle. Has anybody got a pen? Nobody had a pen, because that's another myth about pubs. They'll tell you that all the pubs in Ireland are full of writers and poets. <laughs> Not one of them had a pen. But the barman, he was cute. He said, do you know what you do? He says, just keep saying it to yourself out loud the whole way home and you'll not forget it. That's a great idea. That's exactly what he'll do. So he paid for his drink. He picked up his two bags of shopping. And off he went up the main street of Inniskillen. Open your eyes, sleepy pendoodle. Open your eyes, sleepy pendoodle. Open your eyes, sleepy pendoodle. And the first person he met was an American. 
Howdy, old timer, said the American. He said, he said, you know, my ancestors, they came from the Emerald Isle. And 150 years ago, they left when all the potatoes died. They went over on a coffin ship to America and they done good. They done real good. We made loads of money and now I'm come back. I want to go to the city hall of Inniskillen. I want to see the records. I want to, you know what we call them in America? We call them the hatched, the matched, and the dispatched. I want to see those. I want to see my ancestor's name. Can you tell me where the city hall of Inniskillen is? And the old man looked at him. He says, open your eyes, sleepy pendoodle. I beg your pardon, old timer. Open your eyes, sleepy pendoodle. Oh, gee, it's that building over there. Well, why didn't you say that? Right, have a nice day. And the old American headed off to the town hall and found the records he was looking for. And the old man carried on up the street. Open your eyes, sleepy pendoodle. Open your eyes, sleepy pendoodle. And the next person he met was an actor. And the actor said, excuse me, old fellow. I wonder if you could possibly direct me to the Ardo and Theatre. I'm taking part in the Beckett Festival, you know, and I'm I, I, I'm really very excited about <gasps> Open your eyes, sleepy pen. I beg your pardon. Open your eyes, sleepy pen doodle. Oh, I see, it's over there. Why didn't you say so? Right, very good. Toodaloo, have a nice day. And the actor headed off to the theatre. And the old man, he came down Eden Street then and he was heading for the bus station. And he was all in a panic trying to remember, open your eyes, sleepy pendoodle. Open your eyes, sleepy pendoodle. And just as he arrived at the bus station, this big red bus came in from Dublin. And as you know, it's a very long way on the bus from Dublin to Inniskillen because it stops at every hole in the hedge from Navan to Dunshotland to Cavan to Butler's Bridge and Derry Lynn and Swanland Bar and all these places. And on the bus, there was a little French lady. She had come over to Ireland to learn English. And as you know, the French people are very sensible. When we go on a bus, we drink lots of coke and we eat crisps and we get sick. But they only drink water. The people in France, when they're on the bus, they drink water. But the problem is, if you're on that bus that takes four and a half hours from Dublin to Inniskillen and you're drinking water the whole time, there's somewhere you will need to go very urgently. So the French lady got off the bus and she said to the old man, Excusez-moi, où est la toilette, s'il vous plaît? Now, he didn't understand French, but he could see that she was in difficulty. So he pointed out, Open your eyes, sleepy pendoodle. Oh, merci bien, merci bien. She thanked him graciously and went into the toilets. And when she was finished, she took out her notebook and she wrote down the English for the toilets are over there is open your eyes, sleepy pen doodle. Well, the bus driver says, well, where's your ticket? And he says, open your eyes, sleepy pen doodle. And the bus driver says, go down and sit in the back of the bus and be quiet now. Don't be disturbing people. But he was sitting on the back of the bus and the bus was bumping along, bumpity, bumpity, bump. And he was trying to remember, open your eyes, sleepy pen doodle. Open your eyes, sleepy pendoodle. Wheels of the bus go round and round, round and rascal. They open your eyes, sleepy pendoodle. Open your eyes, sleepy pendoodle. Oh, you can he throw your granny off the bus? Oh, you can he throw a skull? Open your eyes, sleepy pendoodle. Open your eyes, sleepy pendoodle. Stop the bus. I want to wee wee. Open your eyes, sleepy pendoodle. That's your stop now. Oh, thank goodness. Open your eyes, sleepy pendoodle. Open your eyes. So he got off the bus, went through, the, opened the garden gate, went up to the hall door, opened the door, and his wife says, Well, did you remember the sardines and the bananas and the cheese? And he says, Open your eyes, sleepy pendant. Don't talk to me like that. He went down and he grabbed the little puppy from under the table, and what did he do? He started singing. La 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 la. And then what did he say? He said the magic words. Open your eyes, sleepy pendoodle. Open your eyes, sleepy pendoodle. Open your eyes, sleepy pendoodle. And with that, the wee dog opened its eyes and it started running around the floor. It was wonderful. He said, come here, do you see this? Come here, quick, quick, quick. 
And when she saw the wee dog running around, oh, she grabbed his arm and the two of them started dancing. It was better than Strictly. I'm telling you, you never saw such a dance in all your life. Now, the reason I have told you this story is because you might be in this situation one day too. Not just with a puppy, because this works with kittens, it works with rabbits, it works with hamsters and guinea pigs and white mice. It doesn't work with ponies. Do you know why it doesn't work with a pony? Because you can't take a pony up in your arms and cuddle it like a baby. And I wouldn't do it with a parrot, because a parrot might take the eye out of your head. And if you have a fish and its eyes are closed, I'm sorry, it's dead. There's nothing you can do. And you'd look very silly cuddling a fish and singing to it. So just remember, if you ever have a puppy or even a baby lamb that doesn't open its eyes, all you have to do is la la la, la la la. And you say, open your eyes, sleepy pendoodle, three times. So that's that story. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously as you can see from that story it's it's i haven't <laughs> geared for telling in schools mm -hmm. you know and so you can draw it out you get the children to reply it's to shout out the open your eyes sleepy pandoodle and they always forget the singing bit and i say no how many times do i have to tell you and you get them to do the the shopping list to shout out what's on the shopping list and uh it's all about interaction and, and entertainment and Again, I say it's a local story with my own twist on it. And these stories are important because they, they're they the entertainment that people had in the old days before there was television or yeah. radio or anything like that. People would gather around and they would tell just humorous, ridiculous, entertaining stories. There's not meant to be any deep moral or anything like that. It was just, it was a way of passing the time. I mean, that's what... Henry Glassy called one of his books Passing the Time in Ballymanone, you know. And uh, so the person who could tell a story was always very welcome, yeah. you know. And uh, it's a dying art, but it's not dead yet. And I think no. it's, it, it's finding new new places to, to tell stories, you know. There are evenings now, it'll be in a community hall or something like that. People will gather together, tell a few That's stories. It's a good crack. Yeah, it's a good crack, play a bit of music. And it's just a social thing and it's yeah. especially now coming out of covid it's great for people to it start is, it's good. meeting up yeah. with each other again. a cup of tea or a glass exactly. of exactly yes <laughs> exactly yeah 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 and you get a bit of the news and the gossip as well um and it's, it's just it's good fun <laughs>